morning, America. Steve Eisen here. It's May 18th, Friday, here in, in KC metro area of South Carolina. We're here close to the airport, uh, five, ten minutes from downtown Columbia. It's another beautiful day in South Carolina, a little bit rainy today, but we have a special guest. Our feature speaker today is Eddie Drake. He's running for Senate District 35. Eddie, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Steve. And in just a few minutes, you'll hear Eddie's comments and commentary on things like fair tax and the tax situation here in this country. And we've got, uh, we, as some of you know, we've had a little controversy with ballots. But now we really want to focus on the issues and give people a choice between different candidates. I know Eddie is a conservative candidate and will do a good job if elected to, to the South Carolina Senate. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, Eddie. And uh, all you out there, if you're coming through South Carolina any Friday morning, 7 o'clock, please stop by and join us here at the Casey Mafia, this nonpartisan group that's been around for now over 25 years. We have a lot of fun, and as always, everyone has an opportunity to express their views and present their comments to the entire country. So until next week, Steve Eisen signing off. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay, our featured speaker, uh, Eddie Drake, is going to come up. And Eddie, be prepared for questions. No, don't tell what type of questions you get at the end, but come on up. No problem. I wouldn't be running for what your favorite questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Let me take just a minute and uh, I'll just, just a brief minute and explain to you who I am. My name is Eddie Drayton. I'm running for the South Carolina State Senate District 35. Um, I ask that you go on the card that you have my website, www.votedrayton.com. I invite you to visit that website because I'm probably one of the few candidates that actually talk to the issue and not around the issue. This is very important when you're running for office. Because when I decided to run for this office, like I did once before, I decided it was not about winning and losing, although I want to win. It's about making the other candidates talk about the issues, not around the issues. Very important. Um, I hail from Sumter, South Carolina, born and raised, uh, for a third generation Sumterite. My family hails originally from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we, um, we've always been involved, in, we've always been politically minded people in my family. Um, I had to raise raised a child as a single parent many years ago, so I didn't get a chance to get involved. I had something that was much more important to me at that time, was to raise a productive, tax-paying citizen, which I did. 28-year-old son and a 32-year-old son, Theron Drayton and Chad Drayton, Jr. Married to uh, Fran Drayton, uh, of 20, dating her for 20 years, and married for the last four years. She has uh, also two, a son and a daughter. 20 years to say yes? I've been with her for 20 years. Yeah. It took me a while on that one. <laughs> Uncle Brad, it took 10 years for me to say yes to uh, Steve. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, it takes a while after you've had a difficult marriage. You, you always want to make sure that the political winds don't blow in and out, and you make sure you do the right thing. And this, this one turned out to be my soulmate, so I'm very happy with her. But she has a son, 32 years old, who lives up in Clemson. We like to say that he's the only rooster in town up there. We're Gamecocks, uh, but we do like Clemson when they're not playing South Carolina. Uh, and she has a daughter, uh, Dawn Barrett. Uh, uh, Dawn Barrett. She has four. We have, she has four lovely granddaughters that we love very much. So, getting now to the issue at hand that I'm going to talk about this morning. This is an issue that's probably the number one issue on my platform. I've got many, but this is the one we'll talk about this morning. Uh, and it's property taxes. And when you're running for as a candidate for your particular seats, a lot of times you find the issue that's most important to the constituents of your area. And in my area, it, it turns out that it's property taxes. Um, there are other issues, but property taxes are the foremost on my mind. And the reason I bring this issue to y'all this morning is uh, it came to my attention about three months ago when I decided to run. I was sitting um, in Charlotte one night. Uh, with, I'm in the transportation business, and I was sitting up there. I had some gentleman that was in a, in a, in, in a dinner place, and I got a phone call. It came from a, a lady in Sumter, and she had seen my announcement in the paper. And she was she, she, she sounded a little frazzled and a little upset. And, uh, she said, is this Mr. Drayton? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. May I ask who's calling? And she gave me her name. And she said, well, she said, I live in the historic district in Sumter, South Carolina. And I'm very familiar with the historic district. It's a, it's a very old area. They've made it historical to, to help out with taxes. Um, but she said that she had bought her home in 2004 for roughly about $37,000. She said that the local tax assessor's office had just recently appraised her property at $92,000. Now, I assured her that I knew a little bit about it, and I'm, of course, I'm not an expert on it. Um, I'm an investigator by nature, and, and when she starts telling me these things, I want to dig deeper into it and go into it. So I asked her a little bit about what was going on in her particular situation. She said that they had doubled the assessment on her property, and I explained to her that not a year ago that the five-year period of time was up where you had that five-year reassessment on your property taxes. 
on your on your property. And at that time, I was a little upset because the local county councilman had told me that, well, you know, you got did this every five years because you were at, naturally having investment. Then you wanted to do appraise and value. Well, you know, I'm a little disagreement on some of that, but I'll, I'll let I'll let it go with that. So I contacted my local legislature. My local legislature told me that he had already contacted them about that, and they had told him that they were going to wait a year and see if the down spiraled economy in the housing industry would pick itself back up and then they could appraise it a year later. And I thought, well, there's something not fair about that, inherently not fair about that, because the taxpayer, who's speaking for the taxpayer? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking government now, we're talking about the assessor's office and local councilman. And, this, and this, this legislator was telling me that that's the answer he got on the same issue. So then he goes and tells me that uh, he sends me a copy and an email from an editor or a reporter from the state newspaper, uh, Ms. Scope. Oh, and when I saw that, I thought, whew, I've never seen anything from that reporter that is any, in any shape or form favorable towards a conservative libertarian such as myself. So I sent him an email back. I said, why are we going on policy from an article written by this person? She doesn't hold office. And of course, as you know, we didn't get anything done out of that conversation, so I had to let it go, because I'm not someone in a position of, of, of office to do anything about that. So here we are a year, uh, a year and a half later. We get our property tax assessment about a month ago from the local county assessor's office. So being the investigator that I am, I started investigating. And I found out that everybody had gotten an appraisal, and, and the appraisals were up. Well, two months ago, I contacted one of our other representatives about a house bill that come to give us property tax relief for our small businesses and for people who own second and third properties. Because 6% is way too high. In North Carolina, you have 4% across the board. In, South, in Georgia, you have 4%. But in South Carolina, for some reason, we feel the need to pay 4% for our primary home and 6% for our second, third, and fourth homes in our rental properties, in our commercial properties. And it's gotten out of hand. So I'm starting to think, oh, how can we fix this? So I called my, my local representative, and I like him, I'm not going to mention his name, and he told me he had a bill that was going to reduce that 6% to 5%. And I said, well, wait a minute, 6% to 5%. You know, I said, I'm all for cutting taxes, but why can't we do this in a more responsible manner? He said, well, what do you mean, Eddie? I said, well, why can't we take that 6% over two years? Why can't we reduce it 6% to 5% to 4%? Bring it to an even playing field with our neighbors to the north and to the south. I said, when you do that, I said, since we're going to have all these local officials going to be crying foul and say, well, you're cutting our budgets, you're cutting our budgets. I said, why can't we just do it in such a way that the first, first year that 1% comes in the form of a tax credit at the end of the year? Because everybody wants to reinvest in their property. Everybody wants to improve their property. Not only will it improve the property that you own as a second home, if you're renting that home, it will improve the lives of the people that pay rent. It's a win-win situation. He said, well, he said, you know, we, we didn't think about it that way. He said, it's going back to the Speaker of the House because we feel like if it goes in his name, somehow or other we get it passed. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, wait a minute. Have we gotten so far away from our conservative values and, and the way we do things? Have we forgotten the way we work, well, the way we act as conservatives? A responsible manner is not to slash and burn and scorched earth policy. Of course, I would vote for a tax cut because we sorely need it. But why can't we do it in a responsible manner that when we take that tax credit and we give it back to that gentleman that owns that property, he goes out and he hires a contractor, people that need work. He gives them, he gives them something to do. And what happens when we give him something to do? We increase the revenue. We give that local government the opportunity to prepare for a lower tax base. Because we know spending's out of control, not only at the federal level, but at the local level. So while we're doing all this and we have all this surplus at the state, why can't we be thinking in terms of growth as we graduate down? Now, this lady told me something else that was very disturbing in our conversation. She told me that she had already been fighting with the local representatives and she had sent an appeal in and she had done her homework. She checked around and she found out that the, um, there had been no home sold around her and they had just arbitrarily raised her, to her value on her home from I think it was $37,000 to $92,000 for me with the area in the house she's talking about. And I thought that was a little unbelievable. So I did a little more investigation and what I found out was she said that they sent out a tax appraiser. She said it was a Class C appraiser. She said she also realized that that was not the correct person to be doing the appraisals for the local tax assessor's office. 
And she said while she was talking to this tax appraiser, she said she let it slip. I said, what do you mean she let it slip? She actually looked the lady now and said, she, you know, I only did a drive-by. She said, and you know, they're putting a lot of pressure on us to raise property values. And when she said that, I wanted to drive down and talk to her in person. <laughs> and I thought, okay, we got a problem. So we fast forward another month into the campaign. I get a call from a local representative in my county government, and I thought he was a good conservative. I'm not going to mention his name and embarrass him because I have to go to church with him. We all know politics at the local level is the rawest of politics. So I, I said, sure, I'll meet with you next week. So I met with him next week. We had a good two-hour conversation. And in that conversation, he told me about the problems that the local government's having with the drawdown of funds from the state level back to the local level. And I'm sitting here as a good conservative, but a strong libertarian, and I'm thinking, okay, this is good information. I'm glad you're telling me this. He starts talking about how they're going to cut the budget in this county by $3 million. And of course, as a responsible taxpayer, I know that $3 million is an awful lot of money. We do expect certain services from our local governments. And I can appreciate where he's coming from, because we, we, we want clean water. We want sewer. We want our roads fixed. That's the limited government we should all be for. But as I thought about what he was telling me, I was thinking about all the fees that the cities and the counties in this state have been slinging at us, calling it anything but a tax increase, so that they don't have to run for office on tax increases. And that bothers me. It bothers me a great deal. So what I did, what I, what I was thinking about was, while this gentleman was telling me this information was, okay, you know, the federal government sends down mandates to us every single time they pass a bill. And who has to pay for it? We do. We have to pay for things that we don't necessarily agree with. We want the services, but we don't necessarily want the strings that are attached to them. So I'm thinking as a state senator, okay, if we're going to draw down in the next few years and, and, and cut local funding, which they're doing, the point, at some point in time, we're going to start asking for some of our money back that we send to Columbia. Now, what should we be thinking about in that process? Well, what does the federal government do to the state? Why can't the state government do it to the local governments who are out of control with their spending? Taxes are a problem up and down the scale. It's not just at the federal level. It's all over the place. So I'm thinking if we're going to have some tax bills, revenues over the next few years that's going to start giving the local citizens some of their tax dollars back, which we all want, let's start making it in such a way that if you, at the local level, start trying to pass fees, or if you try to tax a man and evaluate his house because he puts a new roof on his house, which we have problems with in suffer, okay? They try to call a, a, roof, a new roof um, uh, an home improvement, when really all it is is a repair bill. <coughs> we fought that battle, we won that battle. But we need to do such, we need to start taxing our local governments in ways that it discourages them from having runaway tax increases at the local level. We've got to start making them responsible for what they're doing to us. We've got to get our taxes under control. We've got to get our spending under control. And when, this, when this fellow told me this, I went out and I told him I would talk about the defunding of local governments. I said, okay, I'm going to help you out here on the campaign truck, because that's what he was looking for. And I started doing it. I went to my website, and I invite you all to go to my website. And on my website, I talk about it's time to do a little assessing of the assessor's office. Primarily because of what I heard from this lady who had her house unfairly assessed and what's been going on all over the state. Well, I ran into this gentleman about two weeks later at a uh, gala chamber event, and I walked up to him and I said, you know, I, I took care of that little problem for you. I said, I've got people talking about it. He looked at me and he told me, he said, yeah, but you're talking about the assessor's office. You're talking about... I knew right then where the collusion was coming from with the tax assessor's office. It's the very people that we vote for at the local level who don't want to face us at election time when it comes to taxes. They want to do it the back door way. And they keep us separated so we don't know. We're not going to keep us separated today in this group here. Okay? I'm here to tell you what's going on. When he told me that, I looked at him, I said, okay. And I backed off and I thought, okay, now I know what's going on. I know the rest of the story. And it bothers me. It bothers me greatly. So now I'm going to talk to you about the solution. 
As a state senator, we all found out what a state senator can do all by himself in the last two weeks, didn't we? Did we not find out what one man can do? He can stop just about anything. We call it minority reports, tabling, filibuster. That's a big word. Well, I think there, there's been a bill recently that came out of judiciary, and it was a bill that actually put to the vote the assessor. Instead of being an appointed official by the local people, it's an office that they were thinking about having as an elected person. I think that was a great idea. But because we have counties in this state that are so jumbled up and gerrymandered and, and mixed with minority versus majority voting habits, they got scared and they sent it back to committee. And I, as a state senator, and the things that I have observed over the years, I'm sick and tired of our state government introducing half-ass legislation. It's time to introduce bills that complete the job. Let's bring the bill back out of committee. Let's put the assessor as an elected person. And then let's put some strings attached. Now you say, what kind of strings are we talking about here? Okay, let's, let's explore that for just a minute and I'll, and I'll wrap up. Let's take the Let's take the neighborhood, the average typical neighborhood, and one that I come from, where I've had my mother lives in one house and four houses have been sold around her. All right, we've got the federal government that gives away money. We all know about that program, don't we? Mm -hmm. They get loans that they really can't afford. They, they, uh, they, what, what, what did we call it? Um, um, the APA or the APR, uh, a fit, uh, the um, movable rates. And it yep. allowed people to borrow money and move in the neighborhoods that they probably really couldn't afford. Freddie Mac? Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac. The medical with Freddie Mac. Exactly. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, and when we assess a home or we appraise a home, we appraise it based on the houses that have sold around it. Well, when we get these false loans, or what I call fixed economy loans, that just jacks the price up, up, up. Nobody has any say-so for the taxpayers. What about me? I sit there and I improve my home. I want to make an investment return on it. I don't want to give that investment to the government. That's why I'm buying that house, so I can make the money. When we give that 6% to 5% tax cut to the state government, why do I want the local government robbing it from me before it gets in my front door? And that's exactly what's going on here. Let's not fool ourselves. So let's take a, let's, when we bring this bill back out and we make the assessor an elected person, Let's give him some guidelines on how he can appraise someone's home. And that's, and that's appraisal that I can really sink my teeth in. Let's put into the mix the, the Freddie Mac false loans people to get. I'm, I'm not going to begrudge anybody to get a loan however they want to get it and buy a house. But I don't want them to affect the value of my house. <coughs> if I can't control what the federal government does from that level, I can sure control it from the local level at the state house. Let's also take uh, um, foreclosures. Let's put them into the mix. And we've got a lot of foreclosures in the state in the last two, three, four, five years. Let's put that in the mix. Now that's, that's something we can all seek our teeth into as a taxpayer and a homeowner. We can bring this down to where, okay, we're even with you now, assessor's office. We're gonna hold you accountable. And these are the guidelines that you have to operate under to appraise my home. And if you step outside those guidelines, I'm gonna call you on it. Because we don't need tax assessors deciding when they can do the assessments on our home every five years. We've had a debacle in this state in the last year. We've had some things happen that we as taxpayers, we have no one standing up for us. And it's time for our state senators and our state legislators to get involved and do legislation completely. Finish the job, make it right, so that we can all get some serious property tax relief. And this will also relate to the small businessmen in this room who have property and you know what I'm talking about. Anybody who owns a building pays fixture taxes, they pay property taxes. 6% is just outrageous. They find out that we're making a little bit of profit and they're the first ones at the front door trying to get it. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know about y'all, but I work hard for my money. I don't make a lot of money. I, I stretch from month to month worried about my mortgage just like everybody else and where I'm going to get my next job. I'm 56 years old and most people don't hire 56 years old. That's why I went into business myself. So I'm asking y'all today to support me, to get behind people like me, and let's go to Columbia, and let's be that one man. Let's be that one man in the Senate, and when a bill comes out and it's not finished, 
we attach a minority report. Or we filibuster. Or we tell the rest of the members in the Senate, no, we're not going to take this anymore. We're going to do what's right by the taxpayer. This is not about just your back pocket or your special interest is trying to get your deal. This is about all of us. We're all in this together. So just please remember me come June 12th. My name is Eddie Drayton. VoteDrayton.com. Thank you very much for having me. Let's give him a round of applause.